Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name is Adam Payne, Sheboygan County Administrator and co-host of this program with Chairman, County Board Chairman Mike Vandersteen, who as you can see is not with us this month and hasn't been for the last couple. Uh, still recovering from surgery, but I'm pleased to report doing well. And uh, if you did follow the County Board meeting this month, he did lead the meeting last night. So hopefully he'll be with us next month. Very pleased to have with us today one of our important department heads, they all are, but Rebecca Persick is our family court commissioner and is a very important role and responsibility. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you. Why don't you begin by sharing a little bit about yourself and, and when you first became the uh, family court commissioner? All right. Well, I was born and raised in Wisconsin. I got my undergrad degree at uh, Lawrence University in Appleton, went to law school in Chicago at Chicago Kent. I worked in private practice for gosh, about nine or 10 years before I became a county employee. I started out doing child support enforcement and acting as assistant corporation counsel for the county, and now I'm the court commissioner. And how does one become a family court commissioner? As some of our viewers are certainly observing, there's elections happening for circuit court mm -hmm. right now, circuit court judge, but how do you become a family court commissioner? Well, there are some statutory requirements. You do have to be an attorney with at least three years of experience, and then you're appointed by the judges in your county to act as court commissioner. And I think sometimes there's a question about what a court commissioner is or does. In a lot of other states, um, they're called associate judges. So it's a, it's a judicial position. I assume a lot of the duties that are assigned to me by the judges. So I assume some of their work, basically. And the former family court commissioner, Terry Burke, actually went on and was elected as a circuit court judge. Yes, he was. So when are you going to follow his? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, there's an election coming up in April, and I am not uh, participating in that election, and that's something we'll have to see if the future holds for me. Well, I know you've done a tremendous job as family court commissioner, and I hope that someday you do aspire to that. And thanks for springing that question up. Sure, <laughs> sure. We've got to ad lib a little bit. <laughs> So tell me a little bit about your role and responsibilities. How many staff do you have? What are some of the key responsibilities of your office? Uh, besides myself, I have an assistant court commissioner and a paralegal aide who acts as our secretary, does all our scheduling, and she has the title of paralegal aide because there's quite a bit of legal knowledge that's required to act in the capacity. There are a lot of cases that come in that have to be heard within certain time limits. Um, just a lot of things to keep track of. Uh, so we have a staff of three, and uh, between all of us, we handle about 5,500 cases a year that come through our office. Wow. And you mentioned that you're appointed by the judges, the circuit court judges are elected, but what are the key differences and responsibilities? What is a circuit court judge doing that a family court commissioner isn't, it, isn't and vice versa? I handle a lot of the preliminary uh, responsibilities. So for example, in criminal cases, I do a lot of the initial appearances where um, a criminal defendant will appear before me. I'll review the criminal complaint with them, make sure they understand the charges and the possible penalties. I'll go over their rights with them. I'll make sure they understand their rights. And then I'll set a bond. And after that, the case is passed on to the circuit court judge. In family cases, um, there's a when someone files for a divorce for example there's a 120 day wait a statutory wait from the time you file until the time you can get divorced and oftentimes if things are very volatile uh, people are in need of a hearing before that divorce happens to set some ground rules to um, divide up personal property to assign uh, responsibility for the house and the ability to live in the house to one party or the other, to set a placement schedule for the children, and establish custody. Um, and so I do a lot of what are called temporary order hearings in divorce cases. So um, those are hearings that are held very early in the divorce process that make an order on all those issues that are in effect until the final hearing can be held. So walk a person through that a little bit, because unfortunately, we do have a number of divorces and we need folks to help clarify who's going to get what and mediate that. Just take us through the steps. Does someone contact your office? How do they get referred to your office? And, and what is the process? 
You mean from to file a divorce? To file a divorce and, and then Just, ultimately before you and mm -hmm. then in some cases before a circuit court judge. Well, my office uh, gives out information to people if they're interested in filing a divorce about how to get those forms. They're available in our clerk of court's office. They're also available online. And once someone files a divorce, they're given uh, an instruction sheet from the clerk of court's office about what to do if they want um, what's called a stipulated divorce. I do final divorce hearings. I do, um, well, in 2009, which is the last year I have statistics compiled for, I did about 190 divorces that year. Um, and I do divorces in cases where all of the issues are agreed upon. It's called a stipulated divorce. And there are instructions when someone files about what they need to do to have a stipulated divorce. Um, the forms packet that they get when they uh, get information about filing divorce also contains uh, the form they would need for requesting a temporary order hearing with instructions about how to do that. So they go to the clerk of court's office or can go there to get information and also you can go online our county website and get information there on who to contact. That's in the courthouse. Mm -hmm. They see you if it's a stipulated divorce where they have agreed to terms. Mm -hmm. But then you mentioned that uh, you also assist with child custody and placement mm -hmm. and that I would think often isn't necessarily agreed to that they need to work that through. Right. I kind of see uh, all kinds of cases because I see cases at the end where all the issues are agreed upon and there's a stipulated divorce and I see cases in the beginning when things are often uh, very volatile, none of the issues are agreed upon and they come to me for a temporary order that will govern things like custody and placement until the final divorce can be held by the judge so you or by me. So you provide the temporary order and you just said until the final decision is made by the circuit court judge mm -hmm. or by you. Mm -hmm. What's that next step? How does that happen? Well, it's really up to the parties. If they're able to reach an agreement, um, they can put that agreement into a form called a marital settlement agreement and they would submit it to me. I would look it over and make sure it meets all the statutory requirements. If there are any problems, my office will notify them of what needs to be changed, what corrections need to be made. Um, and if they're still able to proceed with an agreement, then the divorce will just be scheduled before me. If not, it will be scheduled before one of the circuit court judges. Very good. A lot of time on the divorce process, but I imagine there'll be some folks interested in that mm -hmm. and wanting to learn more about it. On the other end of the spectrum, I know you also preside over weddings mm -hmm. and, and, and can marry people. Mm -hmm. About how many people do you um, uh, bring together in marriage each year and, and how does that work? How does one contact you if they want to do so? Well, it really varies. I think um, I've generally done between 130 and 150 weddings per year uh, and if you want to be married you just contact my office, schedule a date. We normally do them at the courthouse on Friday afternoons. If there's a particular date you're interested, for example Valentine's Day was uh, Monday, we had a wedding that day also, even though it was a Monday, we don't typically do them then. But sometimes if a date is meaningful to a couple, if we're able to work them into our schedule, we'll certainly accommodate them. Mm -hmm. What do you enjoy most about being family court commissioner? And maybe it's not most, maybe it's two or three things, but what is it about the, the job that, that motivates you and interests you? Well, it, despite the difficulty of the family cases, um, that's probably the area that I think is most important and that does motivate me the most because when people come in for a temporary order hearing, they're often in crisis. Um, they're unable to agree and by the time they leave, they have a starting point. They have a schedule to follow. Um, I'm very mindful of the impact my decisions can have on families and particularly on children. And so I try very hard to craft orders that will meet everybody's needs and that are in the best interests of children. And, and that's something that really motivates me. Um, you know, most of what I do, I would say the majority of my cases have to do with family law or with criminal law. And both of those areas, I think, are areas that are extremely important to the public and, and to me. I live in Sheboygan County. I have children. Um, myself and and I want our community be community be, to be safe and I want children to be happy and safe and and that motivates me. 
And about how many cases do you have a year? I'm sure some of our viewers are either curious to know that, but probably have no idea just how many people are going through your mm -hmm. courtroom each and every day. Well, if you add up everything, I, I've touched on the family law and the criminal law, which does make up the bulk of it, but I also do um, mental commitment hearings, the initial hearing in a mental commitment process, and uh, also in guardianship cases. Um, I do domestic abuse injunctions, harassment injunctions. Um, I do the initial appearances in paternity cases, uh, in juvenile delinquency cases, and children in need of protection or services. So when you add up everything that my office does, it's probably about 5,500 cases a year that we, that we hear. Um, and my assistant also does small claims, uh, pretrials, and trials. 5,500, 5,500 cases a year, mm -hmm. and it's yourself, an assistant, and... And our paralegal. And right? your paralegal. Mm -hmm. Remarkable, remarkable. What about the overall caseload, not only for your office, but the circuit court judges? Are you seeing quite an uptick in that? Has it leveled off? What's been the trend the last year or two? Well, it really ebbs and flows. For example, in December, there was a real noticeable decrease in the number of criminal filings that I saw come through, but there was a real noticeable increase in the number of domestic abuse cases and uh, divorce filings. So it, it tends to ebb and flow, and over the course of a year, the statistics um, usually are pretty consistent. Some areas may go up a little, some may go down a little, uh, but it's been pretty consistent, I think. What do you attribute some of the domestic abuse or violence to? What are some of the, I mean, the economy, people being out of work? Have you, are there any trigger points? Well, I think that has certainly triggered an increase in uh, property crimes, burglary and thefts. I've seen an increase in that in, in the criminal filings. As far as domestic abuse, um, very often uh, in criminal cases, alcohol or drugs seem to be at the root of, of mm -hmm a lot of the incidents that get called into the police. Um, and by its nature, a domestic dispute is between people involved in a domestic relationship. Often it's a husband and wife or a boyfriend-girlfriend situation. And uh, there are some <laughs> nasty breakups, I guess, that, mm -hmm. that lead to trouble for people. So um, there's no one answer. It right. differs from case to case. Now, one of the services your office also provides is mediation. Mm -hmm. and prior to you making final decisions or temporary um, decisions on custody, what have you, they meet with individual mediators to work things out. How, how does that work? Well, not prior to the temporary order hearing. The temporary okay. order hearing happens very early in the process. Okay. And, and it's difficult because I don't have the advantage of having a guardian ad litem or having had the parties go to mediation. Um, but by law, before uh, people can have a final hearing, if there is a custody dispute, they have to attempt mediation, where they're, they meet with someone who's trained to help them try and reach an agreement and who's also trained in child development and the type of schedules that might be appropriate for a child given their age or, or um, temperament. And uh, to apply for mediation, you can come to my office and fill out an application form if you want to do that voluntarily. Otherwise, um, an order for mediation will be triggered by the circuit court judges, not just in any divorce case, but any case where there's a placement or custody dispute. Because sometimes after a divorce is granted or after paternity is established, that's not the end of it. Um, people several years afterwards may find themselves in a dispute about the property custody, proper custody or placement a schedule for their child. And in all of those cases, people can attend mediation or are compelled to attend mediation if they want to see the judge. And the guardian ad litem mm -hmm. that represents the child, how, how are they selected and how many do we have that we can draw from to assist people? A guardian ad litem uh, just to clarify as an attorney who's appointed not to represent the child per se, but what's best for the child, the best, best for the, child. the best interests okay. of the child. And that may differ from what a child wants. Um, as a parent, I think we know that sometimes what a child wants isn't always what's best for them. Um, but in terms of selecting them, um, 
there are requirements. Uh, guardian ad litems have to not only be attorneys, but they have to have had special training. Uh, and once they've received that training, they submit their names to the court if they're willing to take cases. And then the judges or I select from that list. And from beginning to end, what can someone expect if they have, if they're going to go through a divorce, have children, go to mediation, uh, are not necessarily on the same page about custody and time? What kind of period of time are folks looking at till that's all sorted through? Well, it really depends. I mean, in a contested case, I think sometimes it can take a year, a year or even longer to work through that whole process. If uh, parties are able to agree either on their own or with the help of a mediator, um, then the divorce can be done pretty close to that 120-day wait from the time you file until the earliest date the divorce can be granted. So it really depends on the issues and and the judge's calendar and what he, he or she has available. As you juggle all these responsibilities and the different cases that come through your office with three of you, which is, I think, pretty remarkable, um, what are the key changes you've seen over the years? What are some of the challenges that have presented themselves to you, and how have you overcome that? Um, well, the main challenges have to do, I think, with the budget, not with the workload per se. We've my secretary has a hard time keeping up with, with, with the workload, and we've addressed that by, uh, for the last several years, having unpaid interns come in to assist in the office, and that has been a big help. Um, in terms of the caseload, my assistant and I so far have been able to juggle that pretty well between the two of us, and it's not always... Um, able to be planned specifically. For example, if I have a temporary order hearing that involves children, that involves a placement dispute, I don't want people to have to walk out without a decision, without a starting point. Um, and sometimes those hearings can take much longer than we've allotted time for because we don't always know ahead of time what the issues are going to be. And in those situations, my assistant uh, very often can juggle her calendar to assume another hearing that I was supposed to start in the courtroom so I can continue with the temporary order hearing. And I, I think the three of us, we've worked together now for seven or eight years, have just developed a real um, good working relationship that, that I hope benefits the public so that everyone can have their cases heard when they expect to be heard and on a timely basis. Well, what I find rather remarkable with your particular area, I mean, every now and then the circuit court judges take some heat in the, in the press, and of course they're in a position where they're not going to make everyone happy, nor are you. But uh, it, I always, as I reflect on the last year or the, your tenure in this office, the number of complaints or concerns I've heard have been, I can count on one hand. I mean, it, I know you have tremendous respect from the clients that you interact with, the attorneys you interact with, and obviously your team is excellent. And the budget issue, as you mentioned, and just for our viewers' standpoint as a whole, this is an issue that you're all hearing a lot about with the state mm -hmm. budget constraints and uh, county government being part of the state government. We're all subject to these challenges. And though Sheboygan County, I think, has a pretty good track record, uh, we've reduced our staff by 30% since 1993 and offices such as the Family Court Commissioner, or Sheriff's Department, Health and Human Services, uh, critical programs and services, for the most part, it's the same number of staff or less that are administering these programs and services. So um, we're getting to a point in government where you know, we're all going to have to take some responsibility to make sure we're paying for these programs and services and contributing to the solution because we need effective law enforcement, we need an effective judicial system, and we need programs and services for the neediest of the needy for our community to be successful. And again, the Family Court Commissioner is a very important role, and you do good work. I appreciate it. Thank you. So as you look ahead, not only the budget from a challenge standpoint, but what other, any other challenges you see coming your way, or are there any new initiatives or uh, goals that you have for your department areas you'd like to see to improved? Well, there are always legal changes that we have to keep abreast of. Um, there's always continuing uh, judicial credits that my assistant and I have to 
to get in order to maintain our positions and make sure that we're on top of any changes in the law which occur. Um, you know, certain case areas of the caseload do increase from time to time, and it's always a challenge to try and juggle that. Um, one of my goals uh, recently is to be able to offer a wedding service in Spanish. Uh, my husband's a Spanish teacher, so I'm hoping he can <laughs> assist me in, in um, translating one of the ceremonies I use into Spanish and teach me to say it well enough to be able to do it, because we do have um, quite a few uh, Spanish-speaking customers who come in for weddings. And not just Spanish, I've, I've started a list. I've done weddings for people from over 50 countries, including um, Afghanistan, Pakistan, um, Moldova, I believe, which I had to look up. I wasn't familiar with where that was. Um, uh, wow. Certain countries in Africa. Um, it's, it's a very interesting part of my job. And, and is performing weddings, is that a... Um of an expected role of a family court commissioner, all 72 counties across the state, do their family court commissioners generally do so? Or does it vary? Uh, yes, I believe so. I know that other family court commissioners do them. I really don't know how many other family court commissioners do. I'd, I'd be interested in finding out. I'll have to ask next time I have a conference. Is that one of the more enjoyable parts of the job? Because at least everyone in the room is generally pretty happy. <laughs> Yes, yes it is, because normally I can be pretty sure at least uh, one of the two parties in front of me is unhappy with the decision that I've made. Right. Um, and weddings are one of the few uh, really happy parts of my job. One of the other areas that from time to time the county board discusses and we get some input from the community is about um, courthouse safety. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks from the public coming in and out of that courthouse every day, whether they're going to the clerk of courts, your office, one of the circuit courts, the district attorney, and we do not have um, armed guards at mm -hmm. the front doors. We do not have security systems that are necessarily people have to walk through. We may for certain uh, circuit court trials, as you know, but what's your role with the sheriff's department and the bail bailiffs, for example, mm -hmm. and how do you feel about the security in the courthouse as, mm -hmm. a, as a whole? Well, I don't have a bailiff assigned to my courtroom. All of the judges do. I don't. I have a bailiff for certain types of hearings. All of the criminal initial appearances, I do have a bailiff. Um, when I have a domestic abuse or harassment injunction case, I have a bailiff present. And if I have a family hearing where I know there's a history of violence because there's been an arrest and a, and a criminal incident or because there's been a domestic abuse injunction filed or issued, will request to have a bailiff present, and those requests are always accommodated. Um, I feel very confident right now with the security we have, simply because the bailiffs that are working now in the courthouse are all very experienced. And I, I think I've mentioned to you privately, um, there have been times where uh, the, the chief of the courthouse bailiffs will come to me and say, you know, I see so-and-so on, on your calendar this week, we're gonna have extra security for you because they're aware of a history even when I may not be. They've all been with the Sheriff's Department for 20 years or more and um, and we, ha we do tend to have a fair number of repeat customers. So um, right. they're, they're very mindful of the people who are coming into the courthouse. I think they do an exceptional job. So with the bailiff staff we have in place now, I feel quite confident with, with courthouse security. There's never any way to be completely secure. Even courthouses who have security at the door have had violent incidents. So um, I just hope for the best. Yeah. So for perhaps some viewers out there, uh, younger viewers who might be thinking about becoming an attorney or becoming a family court commissioner or a judge someday, what would your advice be to them? What do they need to do to position themselves to attain a position that you have? Mm -hmm. Well, they need to get a bachelor's degree first, go to college and get a bachelor's degree. I don't think it's necessary necessarily to major in um, the field of justice or a law-related field. I think it's important to get a broad education um, and and get as much a background in as many topics as you can. Um, to go to law school, 
Uh, you need to be able to write very well, which is not something I think most people may think about. So writing skills are important to get uh, ahead in law school. Um, and after law school, again, it's just important to get as broad a background as you can if you want to be a circuit court judge in particular because they handle every type of case. Um, so certainly the more experience you can get, the broader the experience you can get, the better job I think you'll do as a circuit court judge or as a commissioner. And as you can also see, if you haven't in the last 28 minutes of this program, you also need to have a professional, calm, cool demeanor. And I think Rebecca Persick has provided that throughout her tenure. She is very professional. She treats people fairly. And I can't imagine if I had 5,500 cases going before me every day and the domestic abuse and the, the um, divorce cases and child custody. Uh, I got to believe that's really got to pull at, at folks emotionally. And as a judge, obviously, you have to keep a cool head and be a good listener. And, and Rebecca's done a tremendous job for us. So I appreciate your time today and talking about the roles and responsibilities of your office. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us. Next month, we're going to cover another important department, department head. Our county clerk, Julie Glancy, is going to be here. Uh, Julie Glancy has been with the county for, I think, 30-plus years. She's a very, very professional, experienced department head. And as a county clerk, I couldn't ask for a better one. She provides service to the county board as a whole, the county. And as, as you know, if you follow county board proceedings or if you have a question, the county clerk's office is always a great place to start. So please join us next month to learn more about the county clerk's office, elections that are coming up, redistricting of the county board. The county board's going to be going from 34 to 25, or at least that's the plan to date. And that's going to certainly change our organization a little bit. And if you have any questions about any area in county government, don't hesitate to contact my office, the county clerk, or particularly if it's the family court office, uh, please don't hesitate to co contact Rebecca Persick or her staff. So again, thank you for joining us.